Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments. Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Sound tonight, don't yeah. we? <laughs> Mr. Carter, I think you have the honors. Yes, we do. Join me in prayer, please. Father God, as we join together tonight before you, dear Lord, to do the business of the citizens of Alamance County, we seek your guidance, your direction, that we might do the right thing every time to protect our citizens, to provide for their safety, to provide for their well being to provide for the necessities of running county government. We ask that you watch over us, take care of us, take us all home safely from here tonight, dear Lord. We ask this in the powerful and holy name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. 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 Join me in the pledge, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Do we have a motion as to the approval of the agenda? Motion to approve. Second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. We now have the consent agenda. Oh, excuse me, public speakers. Mm -hmm. um, I may get fired if I skip over the public speaker and him to say yes. <laughs> okay, Paul Caps. Yes. Good to see you, sir. Good to see you. May I hand out some information? Sure. Yes, sir. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Let me announce while he's doing that, each speaker has three minutes, and we have a total of 30 minutes pursuant to our public policy uh, manual and so forth. So um, we'll go through everybody we can, and if everybody limits it to three minutes, then we should be able to have every speaker have an opportunity. Thank you. And that was all my time. Okay, <laughs> good enough. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Paul Caps, and I have lived at 3259 North in C Highway 62 for over 30 years in the McRae community. Our community needs your help in controlling some violations that are going on at a shooting range called Rad Range at 1746 Jim Barnwell Road. The property was just purchased by Rad Range in 2022. I can find no records that a permit for a range has ever been issued. Seems like they just set up shop right outside the city limits. Rad Range has no regard for personal property, safety, or the health of our community. One of the violations is that the projectiles are leaving Rad Range property lines. The range has built their berms on a neighboring property line of Mr. Dunn, tearing down his fence. I have included some pictures of Mr. Dunn's property. These trees are falling because they're full of bullet holes, as you can see in exhibit A and B. Rad Range has crossed their property line 100 yards into Mr. Dunn's property and put up targets. Two weeks ago on Sunday, a neighbor two houses up from the range was cleaning out his deer stand and bullets came flying by. He called 911 and a deputy came out. Both he and the deputy had to get on the ground to keep the hit from bullets. <coughs> the deputy went to the range and closed them down for three days until <coughs> something could be done. However, two hours later, they went back to shooting. And now they have started serving alcohol, which is prohibited on all gun ranges in North Carolina. Grand Rage also owns another business listed at the same address called Whiskey Business. Because of the immediate danger to our neighbors and the fear of being shot while outside on their property when the shooting and serving of alcohol is going on, 
I would like to ask the board to consider stopping the shooting on the range until all permits have been applied for and the state has had time to investigate the range being located there legally. In the Unified Development Ordinance that has been adopted, Section 4.3, commercial outdoor shooting ranges are prohibited in all zones. Just in our neighborhood, 18 new homes have been built less than a mile from the gun range. There are plans for another 35 homes, which will all be straight in line of fire with the shooting range. Because of the population growth and building of new homes, it has become necessary for local government to get involved to address these issues. I have researched five of our surrounding counties and listed below are the ordinance they have put in place pertaining to shooting ranges. We would like to request your help in adopting ordinances that will make our community a safer place to live. Thank you for your time and consideration and all these people here are here because of the problems they are having with the gun range. Thank you. And we thank you. Thank you. Butch McKenzie. Do you mind if I hand sure. something out? These were the surveys showing how this gun range lays on the property, burns on, on Mr. Dunn's property, the range is on Mr. Dunn's property, part of it. The bullets cross Jim Barnwell Road. Would you like? Survey. Else? Okay. Alamance County has a noise ordinance and we see nothing in the ordinance that exempts a gun range. Noise levels above 85 decibels are considered hazardous to human beings. The decibels of a gunshot exceed 85 decibels, therefore it can be hazardous to your hearing. The Firearms Industry Trade Association says, if your shooting range has off-range exposures greater than 85 decibels, structural deficiencies exist that require corrective action and to seek help immediately. We have veterans who live in this area who suffer from PTSD and they, they can't handle all the gun noises and all the explosions that are happening. The gun range is also located in a watershed critical area. The runoff from the range goes into Deep Creek, which empties into the Stony Creek Reservoir. Mr. Dunn has cattle on his property and he can't even have his cattle in certain parts of his property and has to do cross fencing to keep the runoff from going into the reservoir area, the, the critical watershed. Lead from a firing range is allowed to enter waters of a state, either on or off the range. It may violate any of several laws, including and not limited to the Clean Water Act, the Safe Drinking Water Act, the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act. Gun ranges have to register as generators of hazardous waste. Gun ranges must keep records of pickup and storage of spent lead bullets. If an outdoor range becomes more of a threat to the community and environment for failing to follow these rules, the citizens can sue. Gun ranges can face a lawsuit whether they are open for business or not. We recorded on a memory stick and gave it to the previous county attorney a 10 minute video showing the decibel readings on Mr. Dunn's property and my property. They were 113 decibels on Mr. Howard, on Howard Dunn's property and 92 decibels on my property. We also showed the damage to Mr. Dunn's property on the video, and I do have another copy of that if anyone would like to see it. We can make some more copies, but I gave it to the previous county attorney. This is the kind of thing that this gun range is posting on their Facebook page. Want to know what it's like being on a rooftop in Benghazi? Want to feel the rush of emptying 30 round mag of 5.57 in two seconds? Come on down to the Rad Range this Sunday. How disrespectful. On Monday, March the 6th, Mr. Dunn and I went to inspect the damage on his property when an employee from the gun range came down and threatened us for being on the gun range and said that he could go get his AR-15 and shoot us if we were there. We started to leave Mr. Dunn's property when the gunfire erupted. This is the day after the deputy told them not to shoot for three days and they're already shooting, trying to send a message to us while we were on Mr. Dunn's property. That's criminal. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. sir. Sean Francis. Hello, uh, Sean Francis, 4578 Freedom Drive. 
Never get tired of that address. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, after ratifying our current U.S. Constitution, our founders realized the need for important additional protections. Knowing the enormous risks and unpredictable results that would likely occur if they allowed a second convention, they insisted the Bill of Rights be tacked on to the end of the Constitution in the form of the first ten amendments. Alexander Hamilton wrote, a national convention needlessly alarms the fears and apprehensions of all classes of citizens. Thomas Jefferson said he trembles, considering what may result from the second convention, given the present temper of America. I submit to you that the temper of America is no better suited to rewrite our Constitution today than it was in Jefferson's day. Well-funded lobby groups are dangerously close to rewriting our Constitution in an open convention, rather than using the same process that was used for all of the other amendments, because the Constitution is in their way and not ours. Con conservatives seem unable to discern how these proposals actually harm our liberties and make our problems worse. Our representatives Dennis Rydell and Steve Ross have sponsored multiple resolutions aimed at opening our Constitution for a full convention. On Thursday, April 6th at 7 p.m., the Women's Republican Executive <coughs> Committee plans to sell the idea of a full convention to the women that attend. A female speaker was, was requested to offer an alternative perspective. One of the many reasons given by the chair, who is also Dennis Rydell's wife and executive assistant, was that all three of our representatives, including Senator Amy Gailey, was united in their effort to open a convention to revise our Constitution. Supporters are fond of telling you to just relax, supposedly because only three -fourth, it takes three-fourths of our states have to approve whatever is proposed. But remember that all states under the, con the Articles of Confederation had to ratify, that was 100% of the states had to ratify any changes to that Constitution or to that Article of Confederation. But notice what delegates to that convention wrote in our Article 7 of our new Constitution. The ratification of the convention of nine states shall be sufficient for the establishment of this Constitution. That's our Article 7. You see, not only did they first, the first convention completely rewrite our entire form of government, they also changed the ratification rules of this Constitution. And they have that power again today if we give it to them. I'm requesting our county commissioners honor their oath of office to defend our Constitution from all enemies, foreign and domestic, by passing a resolution calling on our state Senate to reject the House's proposal for an Article 5 convention. Then flood Senator Amy Gailey's phone and every other senator demanding they not pull the same shenanigans that Dennis Rydell and Steve Ross and Speaker Moore did to squeeze this through the, the NC House with no opportunity for public comment whatsoever. Or at least provide a forum to, pro to provide an adequate time for both sides of this important debate to be heard properly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Terry Wadale. Terry Wadale. Thank you for letting me address another issue with the re-evaluation that uh, the county has done. Uh, <coughs> one of the unintended consequences of re-evaluation of property taxes and it goes on all the time, but not at 79% increase, is home insurance. Everybody that pays mortgage on a house has to have home insurance, and you better have home insurance just for replacement. But the insurance companies utilize county tax property assessment records to, as, a, as a component of them figuring out what your premiums are going to be. And what I have discovered with myself personally, my premiums have gone up 27% in a year. Now that's just me, and I'm sure other people may have more and may have less, but 27%. That is crazy of an increase of insurance premiums which have not had a claim. And so I'm just saying this is an unintended consequence of a revaluation that averaged 79% in the county. And I guess I say again, 80%, I understand, in Graham and Mebane, and ours was around 72%. And I, I, 
I think we need to really look at this reevaluation that the county has done. I'm not saying they did anything improper, but they did it two years early. The cost of housing, the cost of building materials, everything is beginning to fall. And one of the real estate professionals that I've been, I've been, I was in contact with said now houses are staying on the market on average 100 days or longer. Some more, some less, but on the average. So the bubble has come down. And what I request is that really look at this and maybe redo it. I know it's going to cost, but look at what it's going to cost the people who own property, the people who rent property, because landlords are going to pass it on. So this is an un unintended consequence that I don't think many people thought about, but I think it's going to affect everybody that has homeowners insurance in the county. Thank you. And we thank you. Medora Burke Stoll. Did I pronounce that correctly? Hmm? Sort of. <laughs> okay. You're close. Oh, my messy handwriting. Um, Medora Burke Skull, 3673 Mevin Rogers Road, Mevin. Uh, good evening, Commissioners. Tonight, once again, I'm coming to you on behalf of the Alamance Burlington Association of Educators. Our members have reached out to the executive board that I serve on with some concerns that they wanted me to bring to your attention. Uh, the first concern I've heard from several members is regarding a conversation that happened last month regarding, I'm hearing 0.5%, I'm hearing 0.7%. I didn't really get a... Um, an actual number, but a small percent of county revenue that has historically apparently been earmarked for school construction and maintenance. I don't see it on the agenda tonight, and I, I watched the film of the last meeting. I'm hoping you can help me understand what's being proposed and why. Um, so something about funding a new courthouse, and the, like it has, it has educators across the county up in, up in arms, like there's a lot of questions, and I'd, I really hope that someone can help me understand it. Um, to me, it seems smart to link our capital improvements to like a flat 3.2 million plus a percent of county revenue every year. Because as you know, as the county grows, it's only natural to assume that the capital needs of the schools in the county grow too. Um, I know our county's growing leaps and bounds and that schools are not the only concern that you as a board have to deal with. Um, and it's hard to decide which projects take priority. Um, I just. I would say that we've done so well the last couple terms uh, with our commissioners working with our school board members. You guys have, I've been really proud to be a part of this county and to watch you guys step up to the plate and fix up our schools that were falling apart. Uh, I started in this county teaching 12 years ago and I've seen the schools, like just the quality of the schools improve drastically. My roof doesn't leak for the first time in, in 12 years uh, as of last year and it's pretty exciting. Woohoo! Um, so I, I don't know. I would ask you guys to think about as you as you look at a small pot of money and how we how we distribute that around the county. Um, as people move their families or their businesses here, they're not asking what kind of courthouse we have, but they all ask what kind of schools we have. Um, my second point is some of the folks felt like a little bit of the rhetoric was trending slightly anti-public schools last meeting. Um, Budget season is upon us, you know. Um, I just want to ask that we continue to work to keep our dialogues between the school board and the commissioners and all the stakeholders um, supportive because we're all here for the kids and the families of Alamance County. Um, you guys, like I've been really feeling blessed to serve as a representative for the teachers and not have to marshal out all the red shirts to come and protest during budget season because this board has been so much more functional and the school board has been so much more functional in transparency and uh, treating each other respectfully and I just I really hope that we can keep that going forward. Thank you. And we thank you. In revise. Thank you, Commissioners. My name is Henry Vines. I live at 3450 Isaac Drive in Snow Camp. You bring an ID with you tonight. Sir? You bring an ID with you tonight. Yeah, I do. <laughs> um, I just came uh, up tonight. I wanted just to thank y'all for not passing that uh, Meridian deal. Um, I would just want to pass on from my neighborhood that several people have came up to me and expressed their gratitude to me for speaking up. 
about this. Um, I think that if this company wants to operate under the existing uh, franchise, that's what they ought to do, and I don't think that the state will overturn us because I don't think they'll do that to the county. Uh, the second thing I just wanted to mention was um, the fact that I read in about the depot and how much money we were getting to uh, to do this depot, train depot. Oh, the one point some million dollars from the state, and we're going to contribute some as well. <sighs> Commissioners, uh, I just where do we stop asking us, all of y'all, everybody in this room, to help? Uh, subsidize companies so they can make a profit. If these are certainly state tax dollars, but they're my dollars, your dollars. We pay state taxes in, and where does it stop? Why do why do we have to keep helping other businesses in the name of economic development? If it's such a good deal, why don't somebody do it on their own instead of asking taxpayers to have to pay and foot the bill for somebody to get started? And uh, that's all I got to say, and I appreciate what each and every one of y'all do. I know it's a hard job, and um, I thank you again. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you, Mr. Frank. Mr. Frank Bell. I know he's here. <laughs> Mr. Bell, are there other people in the annex? There's uh, probably 12. Thanks, sir. Probably yeah. Mr. Chairman, fellow commissioners and, and staff, good to see you. Howard, I applaud your efforts and all of you. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you what you're trying to do. I'm here to give some away <laughs> to make a little joy. In 2000, we did a survey by United States Department of Agriculture and we determined that the state of North Carolina is number two in loss of farmland. You see it. I heard a statement tonight that there's 18 houses going up, 35 more going. Well, I'm gonna say this. In November the 9th, 2021, y'all remember, we came out with a program because there's people in Alamance County concerned about all these people that's moving in our county, in our state. They like to eat like I do. If we don't preserve a place to grow food and fiber in this county and in this state, we're going to be in trouble. As a result of that, you guys, thank you, endorsed a program that we call Preservation Alamance. It's on board. It's progressing. On April the 15th, at Cadillac Ranch, all of you remember Farm Fest, Willie Nelson? We're going to have another one here in Alamance County on April the 15th. It's going to be, and this program is designed for you people, not corporations only, to participate. You can participate by giving a donation, by letting us have, give us land that you want young people to farm. You can do by anything you want to. If you ain't left your house in Graham and you want to get rid of it, call us. We'll sell it, the county will sell it and put it in the kitty Oops. to preserve farmland for this county. It's a good thing. As a result of that, I come here tonight and we covet your attendance. 
I'm reminded of the story. There's an old lady in the community. Is my time up? Is that my time? I'm I'm do I'm quitting right now. <laughs> I want you all to know that Bell Farms is going to give you a ticket Thanks, Rick. to Farm Fest, and we covet your presence. <coughs> Being there it's on a Saturday, I think. Mm -hmm. Compliments of Bell Farms. Thank you. Yes, sir. And want to come. I don't want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I've never met. Are you Stephen? Yes. I don't want to do it. Brian Baker, where are you? Are you? <laughs> you want me there? Yes, sir. Reed. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Bell. We appreciate it. Thank you for the invitation. <laughs> These are all the speakers. Let me remind you that our policy says that we as commissioners cannot address speakers at this juncture. There's a uh, period at the end of our meeting where county commissioners can address different issues if they choose to do so. So we're not ignoring what you're saying. We all are listening very attentively, uh, but we just can't speak at this point and address the various speakers. Okay, we now have the consent agenda. Motion to approve. Second. All right, and Commissioner uh, Turner. Thank you. Yes, sir. And saying you have a comment about the uh, consent agenda. I just, I just had a couple of questions. Um, <laughs> Maybe just wait a second for a I would comment that I said at the end of the meeting the commissioners might comment about the speaker's comments, but everybody that scared everybody out of the room. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just had a couple of questions about uh, consent item 5B1, which is the budget amendment lottery funds, the uh, 1.46 million in the lottery funds that goes to the county capital reserve plan or the Alamance County capital plan of which the ABSS plan is a portion. Ms. Evans, uh, I just want to make sure that that is the pot of money that Alamance County gets from statewide lottery funds annually is that right that's correct do you have do you know about how much how much annually the county gets in terms of those funds? um it can vary annually from 2.1 to 1.4 million it's all based on lottery sales and how the uh, lottery commission distributes those monies to the counties um, their current balance right now for abss in the lottery account is 3.7 million dollars so by pulling down this 1.4 million, which is a bit approved by this board and the Board of Education through an MOU, that would leave a balance of 2.3 million okay. that can be applied for for other uh, capital projects for so the school system. That money is available now. That's correct. Who requests the use of that money for use for ABSS capital uh, funding? Oh, so that request would start with ABSS. We would take it through TRC, OSC and then have the Board of Education approve the application and then it would come to the commissioners for approval. Then we would submit that to the Department of Public Instruction for the state's approval. When the state has approved it, those funds are then placed in our accounts and we reimburse ABSS for any expenditures. Okay, thank you. You're what's, what's the time frame on something like that? As far as? As far as you submitting it and getting back from the state. Normally, when the applications are submitted, if they're submitted by the, I think at the 15th of the month, then they're that month. So it's done on a monthly basis? It's on a monthly basis. Thank you. You're welcome. So the bottom line is we allocate the $1.46 million now, which is what we typically do. It's based mm -hmm. on our MOU with ABSS. And that leaves $2.3 million now usable, now requestable, now for use in capital funds. That is correct. Now. Now. Thank you. You're welcome. He means it. Now. And the school board makes that request, is that correct? 
that's we make it the school board approves it and then it comes back to us for your approval correct thank you and that has nothing to do with the pull down of the funds that we were talking about for other projects that's correct this is the 1.4 that is within the capital plan uh, just to remind the board the board of education and the board of commissioners in creating the capital plan through the davenport model that it's also known as the two boards decided that the 1.4 million dollars would be pulled down annually for debt service payments um, so that was to go toward the 21 issue bonds and to keep the property taxes low all right and we are now we've already got that money covered and so we don't need those funds for the bond repayment and therefore we're moving them to other projects no sir this is not for this, the not this talking about the, the 2.3 million correct that could be for other projects yes sir that thank is outside of the plan right now it has nothing to do with this at all that's correct thank you okay any other questions about item number 5b1 mm -hmm. ready for a vote all in favor of the consent agenda signify by saying aye. Aye. aye any opposed it's unanimous thank you care that much of our agenda. Okay, <laughs> yep. we're now moving to item uh, 6A, and that's a proclamation, and who is present for that? Margo. Thank you. Cute shirt. <laughs> Thank you. All right. I'm going to let you say a, a few words and then I'm going to come down and read the proclamation if you don't mind. Okay, thank you. So good evening, everyone. We are truly grateful to the Board of Commissioners for this proclamation. Week of the Young Child is a national event that highlights children birth through age eight, their families, educators, and other early care and education professionals. As citizens of this community, I'm sure you somehow are connected to children or a child between the age of birth through age eight. As an early care and education professional, we know the value of investing in our young children and young citizens, their families and caregivers. We desire our Work Together Wednesday event on April 5th, 2003, to highlight the opportunities available in this community, increase advocates and advocacy for early care and education, as well as gain an understanding of what the needs for our youngest population is. We, the early learning community, are grateful to our partners in SHINE, NCAEYC, Alamance Achieves, Alamance Community College, Alamance Partnership for Children, local child care businesses, Head Start, the City of Burlington, and many more, along with some local businesses that have already joined us, um, Sunset Slush, Dickie Doos, and Burrito Bistro so far. Hopefully some more. So we have this special presentation from Sugar Bowl Performance Performing Band Cummings High School as well. So save the date, April 5th from 5 to 7 p.m. at the carousel, Chairperson Paisley and board members. You will be able to find details of our events for the week on our Early Learning Community webpage of Alamance Burlington Schools, as well as each of our partners in SHINE on their social media platforms and web pages. We are united and focused on the foundation. And remember to invest in the early, in the tiny kids with big fu futures. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you, thank you. At this point, I'm gonna ask the entire board to go down so we can read the proclamation and take a picture. Say, so, board, please join me.
Am I in the Alamance County Board of Commissioners are entering this proclamation uh, on this date, March 20, 2023. Whereas children's cognitive, physical, social, and emotional and language <coughs> and literacy development are built on the foundation of children's positive interaction with adults, peers, and their environment. And whereas a high percentage of families in the community have been impacted by the lack of avail availability of accessible high quality ch child care, and whereas high quality early child care and education can help improve the effects of poverty, detect and remediate delays, identify and help prevent children neglect, and leads to positive outcomes for individual children, helping them to be prepared for school and more likely to succeed throughout life. And whereas high quality early child care and education depend on professionals who ensure that children supported by families have the early experience they need or a strong foundation. And I'm gonna add the community, parents, and churches to that. Early care and education professionals and others who work for or on behalf of young children um, birth through age eight who make a difference in their lives of young children in Alamance County deserve thanks and recognition and Whereas Alamance uh, Burlington School System, along with the Alamance Achieves, Alamance Community College, Alamance Partnership for Children, in conjunction with the North Carolina Association for Education of Young Children, and the National Association of Education of Young Children, are celebrating the week of the young child, April 1 through April 7, 2023. Where, and whereas, the organizations are working to prom, uh, promote and inspire high quality early care and education experience for our state's youngest citizens that can provide a foundation of learning and success for children here in Alamance County. And whereas public policies that support early learning for all children are critical to young children's futures and the prosperity of our society. And now therefore, be it resolved that we, the Alamance County Board of Commissioners, do hereby proclaim the week of April 1 through April 7, 2023, as the week of the young child here in Alamance County, North Carolina, and encourage all citizens to work with support and invest in the early care and education. It's already been signed by myself as chairman and by our board clerk, Tori Frank, and we just say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You can, you can help. Don't say anything. Well, if you can separate that, I think one's, one's there and one's there. I think it's just one. Okay. Yeah, I think it's just one. We present this to you, and I just say thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. I like your sweater. Thank you. <laughs> John and I are both married to retired teachers. <laughs> and one of the two is sitting up here. So <laughs>
So he's 25 plus, and my wife taught for literally 42 years. So we as a board support education. Thank you. Okay, of the opioid uh, settlement, or who's presenting that? Ashley Butler. Is she here? She is. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can I move this over? Yes. Yeah. Alrighty, well, good evening, commissioners. Good evening. I'm Ashley Motley, and I'm the coordinator of health services. I thank you for your time and the opportunity to present to you this evening. My presentation this evening is going to cover the MOA requirements as well as provide overdose data for 2022, information on overdose response activities, and report the, report the opioid settlement survey findings. The North Carolina Memorandum of Agreement requires that each county receiving opioid settlement funds to hold at least one annual meeting with all municipalities in the local government's county invited to receive input on the proposed uses of the opioid settlement funds and to encourage collaboration between local governments both within and beyond the county. These meetings must be open to the public. In order to solicit feedback from the local municipalities, the Alamance County Opioid Settlement Feedback Survey was distributed on November the 23rd to request input on proposed uses of opioid settlement funds and to encourage collaboration among agencies. The survey was emailed to mayors, managers, and the clerk of court and encouraged to be distributed among council members, management teams, judges, department heads, and agency personnel whose work impacts opioids in our community. The survey remained open until December the 23rd. On March the 10th, notica notification was sent to the local municipalities informing the survey results would be presented at this commissioner's meeting and inviting them to attend to share comments and feedback. In 2022, Alamance County had 238 law enforcement reported overdoses, with nine in involving more than one overdose victim. These numbers do not include peer-to-peer -peer overdose reversals, emergency medical services that responded, or emergency department overdose numbers. 39 fatal overdoses were reported. Law enforcement administered 135 doses of Narcan, with 68 of the victims requiring multiple doses of Nar Narcan. Alamance County is fortunate to have a quick response team comprised of a case manager and peer support specialist team at RHA who respond to law enforcement reported overdoses. The quick response team, or QRT, is notified by law enforcement when an overdose occurs and the QRT will reach out within 24 to 72 hours. However, their typical response time is less than 24 hours. The quick response team focuses on overdose prevention by connecting the victims to harm reduction, treatment, and recovery services. In an effort to prevent fatal overdoses in 2022, the Alamance County Health Department provided Narcan training and made Narcan more accessible to our community. The Health Department was supplied the Narcan for community distribution by the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services. Narcan kits are available for citizens at the front desk of the Health Department for free with no questions asked. And I did bring an example of what one of the kits look like that we have um, at the Health Department. In collaboration with agencies, along with, in addition to the health department, the Burlington Police Department, Alamance Cares, Starting Point Rural Harm Reduction Collective, and the Quick Response Team at RHA, in total together distributed 1,862 Narcan kits. <coughs> now we're gonna discuss the survey. 40 participants completed the opioid settlement feedback survey. 2%, which was one judge or court official, 10% or four elected officials, 13% or five city and county management, 15%, which included six department heads, and 60% or 24 operational staff. Survey participants were asked to rank a broad range of categories. The categories included prevention and education, harm reduction, treatment, and recovery. We asked them to rank them in order of they felt was priority. The first priority to the, that was identified is prevention and education. 
Prevention and education is the promos promotion of constructive lifestyles and norms that discourage drug use. The second priority was recovery. In the North Carolina Memor Memorandum of Agreement, Recovery is defined by the American Society of Addiction Medicine. It defines recovery as a process of sustained action that addresses the biological, psychological, social, and spiritual disturbances that are inherent in addiction. This effort is in the direction of pursuant, uh, con consistent pursuit of abstinence. The, US, the use of FDA-approved medication for treatment of substance use disorder is consistent with abstinence. Third ranked was treatment. The American Society of Addiction Medicine states that all FDA approved medications for the treatment of opioid use disorder should be available to all patients and that ongoing maintenance medication in combination with psychosocial treatment appropriate for the patient's needs is the standard of care for treating opioid use disorder. The fourth priority was harm reduction. Harm reduction is a set of practical strategies and ideas aimed at reducing the negative consequences associated with drug use. Harm reduction incorporates a spectrum of strategies that include safer use, managed use, abstinence, meeting people with drug, meeting people who use drugs where they are at, and addressing conditions of use along with use itself. Survey participants were then asked to rank how strongly they agree with each of the following statements on a scale of zero to 10. Zero reflecting that they strongly disagree and 10 strongly agree. The strategies that were included in the survey were from the Exhibit A, North Carolina MOA, High Impact Opioid Abatement Strategies. The first strategy, the, the highest, I'm sorry, the top ranked strategy was early intervention. It ranked at 7.15 out of 10. Opioid settlement funds should be used for early intervention programs, services, or training to encourage early identification and intervention for children and adolescents who may be struggling with problematic use or mental health conditions. This could, this could include programs like youth mental health first aid or training programs that target parents, caregivers, teachers, or professionals who are in contact with children and adolescents. Employment-related services. Employment-related services ranked at 6.675 out of 10. Survey participants ranked employment related services to support the people to support people in treatment or recovery or people who use drugs such as job training, job skills, job placement, interview coaching, professional attire, re relevant courses at the community college or vocational school as well as transportation vouchers to such activities. Reentry programs ranked 6.65 out of 10. Opioid settlement funds should be used for reentry programs that connect incarcerated persons to addiction treatment, recovery support, harm reduction services, primary health care, or other services upon their release from jail or prison. Recovery support services ranked 6.425 out of 10. Opioid settlement funds should be used to provide evidence-based recovery support services, including peer support specialists or care navigators based in local health department, social services offices, detention facilities, community-based organizations, or other settings that support people in treatment or recovery. Criminal justice diversion programs ranked 6.275 out of 10. Opioid settlement funds should be used for criminal justice diversion programs to support pre or post arrest diversion programs or pretrial service programs that connect individuals in the criminal justice system to addiction treatment, recovery, support, harm reduction services, primary health care, prevention, and other services. Post overdose response team, six, ranked 6.025 out of 10. Funds to support post-overdose response teams that connect persons who have experienced non-fatal drug overdoses to addiction, treatment, recovery support, harm reduction, and other services and supports that they need to improve their health and their well-being. Evidence-based addiction treatment ranked 5.925 out of 10. Opioid settlement funds should be used to support evidence-based treatment for opioid use disorder. Evidence-based addiction treatment consistent with the American Society of Addiction Medicine's national practice guide guidelines for treatment of opioid use disorder, including medication-assisted treatment. Addiction treatment for incarcerated persons, ranked 5.825 out of 10. 
opioid settlement funds should be used for addiction treatment for incarcerated persons supporting evidence-based addiction treatment including medic medication assisted treatment with at least one FDA approved medication to persons who are incarcerated in jail or prison naloxone distribution naloxone is the generic name for Narcan um, opioid settlement naloxone distribution ranked 4.5 out of 10 Opioid settlement funds should be used for naloxone distribution. Support programs or organizations that distribute naloxone to persons at risk of overdose or their social networks. Recovery housing support ranked 4.45 out of 10. Opioid settlement funds should be used to fund recovery housing support to people in treatment or recovery or people who use drugs, such as assistance with rent, move-in deposits, or utilities, or fund recovery housing programs that provide housing to individuals receiving medication-assisted treatment for opioid use disorder. Syringe service programs ranked 2.85 out of 10. Opioid settlement funds should be used to use for syringe service programs, supporting syringe service programs to provide syringes, naloxone, or other harm reduction supplies and the disposal of used syringes, and connect clients to prevention, treatment, and recovery support, behavioral, and primary health. A lot of information, I know. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Um, so to conclude, the top three ranked strategies from the survey um, were early intervention, employment-related services, and re-entry programs. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. On, uh, the pages are not numbered, but the materials that you provided to us, it shows that uh, survey participants, elected officials, 10 percent. Uh, who, who all participated that were elected officials or do you know? We do not know. We, we don't, we were, um, did the survey completely anonymous, so we do not know who anyone was that completed the survey. More questions? We thank you. What, what? Uh, I see Tony. Uh, Hold on just a minute. Sneaking up behind. Yeah. No, just, just a reminder, Mr. Chairman, so municipalities were invited tonight to make comment, and I don't know if there are any in attendance to um, make, make their comment, any further comments from the survey. Super. You say from the audience or from anyone? From, from the audience. They were invited to, tonight to make any further comments to, specific to the survey or the MOA. Excellent. I'd like, I'd I'm like sorry, John. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'll finish. I'll go when you're done. All right. Anyone on this side that would like to make a comment? Sheriff Johnson, anything you want to say? <laughs> Let's spend this money wisely where we can get the most effects out of it. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone on this side? Ms. Thompson. Okay, thank you. Um, a couple of weeks ago, um, I went to see the sheriff and to talk about, and I emailed Heidi and Brian, and to talk about um, our county launching a um, awareness campaign about fentanyl and <coughs> anything else, all these drugs that are taken us out. We, we've definitely got the data to prove it. And because um, when I was a community educator for Family Abuse Services, I would go talk to a squirrel in the park about domestic violence. Um, you have to saturate your county, your community, because um, a lot of times people don't know about these things until they're right in the middle of a crisis, and you need to go where right then. And that's what we are. We're in a crisis. And when I hear um, all this talked about, I recently shared a post that um, WRAL did a documentary. It was excellent with Attorney General um, Josh Stein. He's on our Governor's Crime Commission. And um, he's done these lawsuits, and we've come out really good. It's, it's interesting how you can sue drug companies to get money to help people they got them addicted to, and they're still selling drugs. But whatever, I'll take what I can get. But I talked to the sheriff about um, us forming a team to go out and talk to people in the community. Um, when we did rezoning from the schools, we went to schools and pulled each school system community in to talk to them about it because I'm no fool to think that everybody at, is home eating popcorn watching this movie right here as our commissioners. And we need to go to them instead of always expecting people to come to us. That's just not how it is. Because our kids are dying. Um, last week there were two moms, week before last, two young moms that passed away and left children, orphaned, little kids. And, um, and you know, what's gonna happen with them? 
And so anyway, it was about, he was talking about this money really needs to be spent on recovery and prevention because um, prevention is so much better to start out instead of trying to fix it after. Because working with addicts is a war and it's just not something that gets fixed. It's, it's going to chase them forever and anything can trigger that to go to take a step back. Um, and also heard about re, uh, reentry. That would be fill at Sustainable Elements. It's a great resource to be able to use because when people are in prison, they don't come out with keys to their brand new house and their brand new car to get their brand new job. They are coming out like they're just butt naked and they got to do everything else to get back in this world. And we have to help that because um, I want them to be successful, but I don't want them to go back because they got a family to take care of and they mean a lot to some people. Um, but this going out in the community, and, and I also requested to Heidi and uh, about us bringing Surrey County's opioid response crisis team here. They are the playbook for the state. They were at my last PTRC meeting, and Mark was there, the director, talking about how he's getting federal grants to help add on to this because this has taken their commissioners, really supported them, pushed their whole community into doing this because I think what one year they had maybe 700 overdoses. It just, it's just unbelievable. We can't even imagine. And you can't imagine it till you are walking in those shoes. And they're horrible shoes to walk in. Um, sometimes they take your children. But the one thing that I saw in this documentary was a, a mom and her 17-year-old son had gotten to where he was extremely academically gifted, but he was struggling with some stuff and has gotten a pretty nasty Xanax habit. And he got arrested for it and he spent 10 days in jail, and this was Orange County. And in jail, he met a much older guy that was way up the chart when it come to his drug profession. And when they got out, the older guy got him some heroin and it had fentanyl in it and this boy died, just like that. And um, it's one thing I know about our lesson Sunday about forgiveness. It's just a big, big thing. Um, this mom went to, this reporter went to see this young man in jail in his 40s and he could hardly speak because once you get clean, you can really think clearer. And he talked about how he totally took responsibility for this young boy's life because it happened that way. And the two moms of the child, the child of 17 and the mom of the boy in prison got together and are working together to get the word out together because who better than a before and after to really show anybody they talk to the dangers of these drugs that are literally stealing our people, young and old, whatever, and leaving children without parents. And who's going to take care of these kids? So um, I'd ask for Surrey County to come here to do a public forum for us and all the, not just the populars, but people that are in the face and out on the streets doing the work with the addicts. They know where they live, they know who they hang around with. It's this own little community. And, um, and our law enforcement commissioners, whoever, we need to have a bunch of eyes and ears at the table hearing about this, how important this is, because um, we are real popular for the cartel. They just love us here. We're just like homebound, here we come. And don't be fooled to think we don't have that here because we do. They're everywhere. And, um, and, and one other thing I just wanted to add was about residential treatment centers. Um, this PTRC has funding grants for residential treatment centers to be built, millions of dollars to work with that. We've got Living Free and they're busting out the seams and their seams can't take anymore. And they do phenomenal work. Praise God they do it with Christ. Done, said it. That's the way to really win this battle. But um, there's another place called Hope Center Ministries that I worked for for a brief month. And um, being elected, it was kind of a conflict with me raising money. And I'd rather talk about them and help them get here than ever be a conflict with being elected. But they do the very same thing. They have 41 agencies across this, this great country. And I'm seeing amazing work with them because I've got several clients in there now that are, are really killing it. I think some of our money needs to go to places that are proven. I don't have to start up and be brand new and go through all kind of evidence base and data and all that. These are proven. I mean, I, I'm, an, I'm an ex, a witness to this. And because um, we got to get real. I'm, I am all about our diversion center. It's going to be the role, the core of all of this. But we have got to have somewhere to divert people, not just day treatment. God bless it. It's never worked for anybody I've ever worked with because this is serious career addiction, career addiction. Um, and I lead Celebrate Recovery every Thursday night at my church. And, you know, I can miss somebody that are there all the time, and I can tell when they've, they've relapsed. They come in two or three months later, and they look like they've relapsed because it is that powerful. 
unless you are part of a family. If you got an addict in your family, you all got a drug problem because it will literally suck the life out of you. And so whatever money we're getting, we need to be like the sheriff said. We need to be really vigilant about it. And we need to make sure we use it for the right thing to make a difference in the lives of so many who are being destroyed. Um, it's, it's hard to work with people and they die on you because of one little drug that gets in their system that is that powerful. And I'm gonna give the devil full credit because this is one of his best things he's ever done. And, um, and we've got to go to war against it. And we hear this all the time, but I mean real war against this because if we don't, we don't have enough taxpayers to pay our bills because they're gonna all be gone. And, um, and I, I don't say that lightly because it's just one after another after another. And if we don't really take it serious and as leaders, really get ticked off at what this is doing to folks in this community across this country. And I'll just watch it just coming in like a tsunami. And um, if, sometimes I think if I had the money to build a wall around this county with guards all around the top, that would be enough to save us. But walls keep out the enemy, but they always keep you inside and you can't go anywhere and you can't grow and, and make a difference. So there's no better platform than a former addict to get up here and talk to us about how they won. And it is so many of them. I can bring several up here. The, when I've seen them in jail, it was like, hello, Satan. And I don't, I mean it, I mean it. It is that bad. And then see them now, they're absolutely astounding, successful, and doing well. And that's who you need to talk to. You don't need to talk to us or the pros in the business. You need to talk to the ones that have lived this hell because it is a hell for them to live. And that means their whole family's living that same hell. Anybody you love, that's what it is. So this money, we can't sit back one day and go, God, oh, man, we should have done that, but we just got really distracted. We have got to face, my pastor says, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. And that is addiction because it affects everything. You can't work. You don't have anywhere to live. You're, you're just in a, it's a money pit, and you're in the middle of that pit. And you know what? Sadly, people don't care. Just you know, get rid of them. How do you get rid of people? You don't. There's no bus going to Mars. And, um, and that's our responsibility as human beings is to care for our own because people make mistakes. Addiction is alcoholism, it's pornography, it's gambling, it's anything that takes us away from what is right. So I encourage us, this is something that we need to do, that we need to be what everybody else wants to be and to do this right. And Surrey County is just the county that can help us because they have walked through the fire with this and they have a plan. And we'll be fools if we don't have them here to talk to us about this and help us walk this same path. Because if we don't listen, then every time somebody ODs, just write our name right on it too. So that's all. Ms. Lash, what do you think you want to say? No, sir. Mr. Turner. Thank you. Is that yes or no? I said no, thank you. Uh, Mr. Carter. Thank you. The only thing I want to say is that our new diversion center, we have a diversion center currently, um, and we have a new, thanks to VIA, uh, our building a facility that will have up to 16 beds and so forth, and Ms. Hook, would you be the one to answer when that new facility might open? I don't know the exact date. It's planned for this fall. Right. So in a few months. So that will hopefully dramatically expand what we can do for those in need. Thank you. Thank you. Just one quick question, Mr. Chairman. Are we in contact with the Surrey County people? We are. Okay. If the board would like to have them come before them, we can schedule that at an right, upcoming board. meeting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Health Director, would you like to say anything? No, sir. No. We thank you. Thank you. He's next. Great job, Ashley. Thank you. Ms. Hook, I think you're next. Well, tell us that. Uh, <laughs> she is our uh, deputy county manager. Good evening, commissioners. Um, I just wanted to come before the board tonight to talk about the status of one of our buildings and ask for funding for an emergency repair for it. A few years ago, we went through a study and we rated all of our county facilities. There was one of our buildings, there were a couple of buildings that were rated D, and one of them was the Environmental Health Building. 
Um, it was when we gave it a D, it meant that we were either going to completely renovate or demolish the building. And we have not done anything with that building for a while. This year, um, in this fiscal year right now, we are working to replace the building, uh, the roof on that building and three HVAC units. And um, so those projects are budgeted. They're out for bid right now. They'll be done in a few months. <coughs> Last week, we had a little issue with that building in that there was a crack in um, the floor, in the tile of the floor, and then looking at it a little bit closer, we ended up with a hole in the floor. Pretty sizable hole, one that somebody could easily <coughs> step through. And what that is from is there's an old piping system from the original heating in that building that goes down the entire length of the building and it's supported on both sides by concrete. That concrete is um, crumb crumbling, deteriorating, and basically now we have a hole. So what you've got is a channel that runs underneath the floor all the way down. What we're asking for is $15,000 to fix the one office that has the hole in the floor. And then also note that this is a short-term fix. Um, in the capital budget for next year, we'll be asking for additional money to go through and fix the floor for the entire length of the building. So that's going to be about another $90,000. Um, so at this time, all I'm asking is for the Board of Commissioners to approve moving $15,000 from appropriated fund balance to the maintenance department in order to cover the cost of this unplanned repair. And I will be glad to answer any questions. Oh, oh. Um, is the 15 going to call, is, is <coughs> paying the 15 now, are we going to have to replicate that expense when we do the rest of the So repairs? I have Joel Clark, who is our facilities director here too, but no, we're going to fix that one little section and we won't have to touch that again, but we will need to go through and fix the rest of the buildings. And it's, it's kind of a big deal because we have to pull up all of the tile, we have to do abatement, um, do the repair, then put new flooring down. So it's kind of a big deal. There are 20 people in that building, so we're also going to have to relocate them and all of their things in order to make this repair. Could you tell who's listening where this building is? Yeah, actually, I wrote the address down. 209 North Graham Hopedale Road. So it is attached to the um, Ag Extension and Soil and Water. It's Graham Hopedale before you get to the Human Services Center. I just have one question. Sure. Um, I spoke to Heidi on the day this happened, and as soon as I heard a floor was in, I had to go check it out. I just had to go see it. And it is quite, ex I won't say extensive, but you don't see issues like that mm -hmm. in any buildings I've been in. Right. Mm -hmm. My question is the 15000 I think, definitely has to be done. Mm -hmm. Would we do ourselves any favor if we looked at the extra 75? Because I went over there and mm -hmm. went with uh, uh, Rebecca Rosso, who's the department head there, and she actually gave me a little tour. My nephew loved it, absolutely loved it, <laughs> uh, because I picked him up from school that day and went by. And I looked at the, the renovations that they're doing on one side of the hallway, and I noticed that where this happened is just on the other side that they actually cut it in the middle, so we're gonna do this side first, mm -hmm. and we're gonna start on that side second. When I first looked at it, where this occurred is just right across the, the middle line, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And I was saying, should, would, we better, would we be better off by attacking this problem and fixing it now, allocating the $90,000 mm -hmm. to get it done, just the reason being is like when I was there, I realized that I saw that things were off the walls. They're definitely renovating that that wing of the mm -hmm. that building, and that building is quite old, right. very very old. I remember as a little kid walking through that building, <laughs> like wow, you know. So, but I was just going to ask, since it's fifteen thousand, you said it's a short term fix. I would like to look a little further down the mm -hmm. road, and maybe since the workers are already there and they're already doing construction work there would it be in our best interest to go ahead and allocate the funds and since the workers are there, get it done now, since you're working on it now. Right. 
So yes, it would be great to get the allocation now. We weren't sure whether or not we would get that much money. So it would be great to do that. Even if we were to say, yes, we're going to go ahead and do the rest of the building, we're going to have to do it kind of in sections because mm -hmm. we've got people in that building, and there is a lot of yes. lot of stuff in that building, too. So it, the best thing would be to relocate everybody and just do it all at one time. I don't know that we're going to be able to yeah, do that. Yeah, I didn't that. think. I, I looked at that as well, and mm -hmm. I didn't see any place to put them. I mean, right. I felt bad for the folks that half of the workers are, you know, trying to relocate their office while it gets right. done. And I know that this work's not going to get done in a week. Yeah. It's probably not going to get done in a month. So these people are really going to be put out, so to speak. And we really need to do what we can to get that building up the mm -hmm. bar. Yes. Uh, just to tell my other commissioners, I have never seen concrete look that way. You can tell mm -hmm. that the concrete is old. And just you can just tell when you look at the, the hole in the floor that this is a problem that needs to be fixed and ninety thousand dollars to me doesn't seem like a lot of money to fix this mm -hmm. it, it's not compared to some of the things that we've dealt with in the past mm -hmm. right. I know that. so I make a motion that we take care of this uh, I would get some direction from you about how much we need to allocate for this and and what type of uh, what what funds what capital would it come from let me slow you down so, just yes, with this sir. question. Uh -huh. We have two issues. We have displacement and the building itself versus funding. Mm -hmm. So I think we have two questions before we can vote on this. Um, what are your, is your recommendation upon displacement and doing it all at one shot, which I think is a great idea. <laughs> uh, and the second question is, do we have the funding to do it currently? Take the funding question if you'll so as far as the displacement then uh, we will we have I mean we've talked with Tony and his area they will do what they need to do so they are all for getting the right the building fixed the way that it needs to be fixed so if we can get it done now then we definitely would do that um, the timing is actually I wouldn't say great but it is kind of good in that they just closed their vaccine clinic so there's a little bit of space there um, they have their environmental health inspectors can work more re remotely um, the big issue is all of the files and things that they have there so that's why I say I think that we're still going to have to do it in sections you're not going to be able to completely um, completely empty that building to make the repair so you can handle it as far as moving people in and scheduling yeah I think I like a, love a challenge right so <laughs> <laughs> we'll put a good great plan together there, there are challenges right first and foremost we got to look at the impact of the customer a lot of contractors know where to go um, to, yeah. to come pull their permits, so on and so forth. So we'll take that into account. Um, the second piece is right. A lot of our files, um, often we've got to pull permits. Some of those go back decades, right? And they're yeah. housed over there. There's old files that we have to pull for those permits, and there's a lot, and those files are heavy, and so we've got to be very careful how we move those. But and then there's the staff, right? But we can, while this is um, uh, being done, we can plan this in phases and adapt and adjust as necessary. And of course, communicate, communicate to the customer what's going on so hopefully they know where to go and we can have a little disruption as possible. So you we'll want us to approve it if we can come up with the funding? We love that. I bet <laughs> we can knock it out. Yeah. Let me get this right. Get you live basically in a tent in the middle of a parking lot vaccinating people and, and this is a problem. This seems like nothing. What's what oh walk them off? What about where we had all of you over there? Could we rent that while you're just super speed getting all this fixed? The, the, which, I'm sorry. It used to be Waccamaw. It's over at the oh. JRs. Really that oh, gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Hey, anything is possible. Yeah. But as long, as long as we have a good plan, again, we're going to put the funding forward. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Oh wow. Well. We can so squeeze by. Let's think about this for a second. <laughs> I just I just think it's you know it's like water coming out of a roof in a classroom. It's the same thing. I don't know why we think that we're supposed to just you know. We would really use band-aids for the that. rest of our lives. That's our employees. The public is understanding. That. Let them know where to go, and they'll be fine. So, Ms. York, you're saying yes to it now? Yes, our, our workforce would greatly appreciate this investment in the infrastructure of their building. Uh, I saw in the packet that you have, you're, you're working on that building, you put some HVAC units and some other mm -hmm. things in it this year. It's already on the budget. That's yeah. right. And if you look at the prices that we're paying for that, this $90,000 is not that much really is mm -hmm. so I make a motion that we take care of this is the ninety thousand dollar number the one that I need to use for my motion that's the amount we'd like to allocate Joel? List that is the that is what we're looking at right now is around ninety thousand to do the abatement and put back that okay. is a rough estimate because we don't know what we're going to find yeah. once we get through the three yes. layers that's of fire. what I was yes. afraid of because mm -hmm. uh, when I first looked at it I was like oh geez yeah. once you, it's only like about this far yeah. it, but <laughs> like if the concrete get that soft at the top, imagine what it's at the bottom. Right. It's not going to be like forty-one million. No. Whenever no. you <laughs> no. No. We're no. No. <laughs> no. Well, um, uh, I make a motion that we use the ninety thousand dollars from our unfund balance uh, for our fund balance to uh, make these repairs at the uh, environmental health services building. And I will second that for the third time. Any other question? Quick question: Does. Um, Making a plan for the entire fix in any way delay the immediate concern, which is the hole? No, because we are already working on that. Okay. Yes. They're so very no. close. It's, yeah. it's right, basically, if you put a line in the middle of the building, yeah. it's just right over the middle line. So it's like, you know, they're doing that side. So I think as they're doing it, that this could be done as well because it's right there in the same workspace. Okay. I watched the movie The Core this weekend. The question they go as well. The center of the earth. Brought up. See that. Could uh, rent another building, such as the one we used for the uh, inoculation vaccine. They know you. And, and, and yeah. empty it yeah. out and get it done. So, so those are all options, and we'll look at all of those. I think, you know, I, what our concern is, and Tony mentioned this, is that if we is relocating temporarily and the confusion it causes for the public. That's oh, really what our yeah. concern is. Um, but, you know, we may get into this and realize that that's the best option, um, but it does cause a lot of confusion when you when you relocate, even if it's temporarily. Well, we but did it with we'll taxes. work on all of those yeah. things. We did it with taxes. Mm -hmm. People mm -hmm. will find you. I, I would hate to think that people have to work in the middle of a remodel of the whole building. Yeah. And uh, that's something to think about too. Tony, do you have any slow stuff? Down. Do you have any room in the uh, the mental health building? That, do you have any spaces in there? Mental health. That building. would be your vaccine clinic. Yeah. Well, I'm oh, the, uh, where yeah. we meet for our board of health meetings. You know those offices that we have on the second yeah, floor. Yeah. So it's a little bit tougher for yeah. the the contractors coming in there. So for possible staff that need some office space that would be some options there but you don't have a lot yeah, but I, I think we do I mean we have a couple options okay. we've had previous conversations mm -hmm. with Joel and Sherry to start really thinking this through okay. um, so we'll just put it with this thing our notice the grindstone or whatever that saying is Excellent. And we'll get to work and start planning it yeah well, we appreciate it thank you, you just had a break too long there didn't you <laughs> <laughs> any other questions we have a motion and a second all in favor signify by saying aye aye, aye. Any opposed? Unanimous. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. County Attorney. Yeah. Um, nothing for me tonight other than I've taken on board some of the feedback we got from our public comments earlier uh, on, on some of the issues that were presented. Taking that on as an action item, and I'll be ready to talk to the board about that at some point in the near future. That's it for me. Thank you all. Thank you. County Manager. Nothing further, sir. All right. Um, County Commissioner's comments. I'll just start over here and go down the road or start over here. <laughs> Don't care. Ms. Thompson, you're the lady. Oh. You want to start? Okay. Um, I'd like to um, reply back to Mr. Waddell. I think he's already gone. He was talking about um, the reval and all that, and I'm hearing about how many um, appeals we're having, and it's still a pretty hot topic, and it's kind of linking up with spending a whole lot of 70 plus million dollars for a courthouse edition. And I got my Alamance news, and it couldn't have been at a better time um, this week. And I 
saw all of the um, tax liens. And these are people that right now are struggling to pay their taxes. And there's some pretty hefty amounts in there. And it was, um, it was overwhelming. And I know that's every year, and every time, hopefully, people will do that. But I just want us to think about that. Um, he's talking about the housing thing is coming down. I know we have to do things. I think the tax department has done exactly what we asked them as commissioners to do. Well, was asked of them to do. And, um, and it's just it's kind of a big shock and all. And um, we need to really think about that. And when it comes to us spending money, I saw where a couple of banks, uh, the Silicon Valley Bank, what they've done, what management, and just um, more stuff with the <coughs> world situations and all the just inflation. Everything is just really at a real uncertain time for everybody right now. Um, an election's going to start. I mean, you start running for president 10 years before and start talking about it. I've never seen anything. It's like all we do is run for election. And what are we doing when we get there? So um, I'm talking about national. So, um, but anyway, I just want us to think about stuff like that when it comes time to um, for these appeals to go through. I know the five people that um, we have picked ourselves to do this. I know I have Henry, and I, I, I'm so confident in you, and I know the other ones as well. It's just such a group of high integrity people that will do right by the citizens and by the county at the same time. So um, I just encourage us to always be extremely smart with how we lead and, and the decisions we make, and sometimes they're not easy. They're not supposed to be. That's why we were blessed to be in these roles, to make sound, solid decisions. So um, um, I think everybody knows how I feel about certain things. And, but when I saw that and I saw all the names, and I knew several of them, and I thought, what in the world? And um, at any year, it can be my name, it can be your name, it can be anybody. You just don't know what you're facing. And right now, I think the whole country is facing a whole lot of stuff. It's really heavy um, with children, with opioids, with drugs, with crime, with everything. It's just really frightening. And, um, and it's getting younger and younger. So many teens are really involved in assaults with deadly weapons, and they're taking it a step further. And um, like I said, we've just we got a lot of issues, and we got to really get ahead of that so that um, our county will feel safe. And when you're safe, you're out, you're doing more, and you're having a better time. And that's what everybody deserves. Just like I want kids' schools to be safe and happy because that's the best time of their life. It's supposed to be, and we need to make sure that's always the case. Mr. Lynch. I have no comment. <laughs> Mr. Turner. Uh, just that. I think we can all agree that uh, if there are rounds going off a, off a gun range, that's not an ideal situation. So I'll be interested in what you come up yeah. with, Mr. Stevens. Mr. Carter? On this uh, revaluation, I was going to make a comment about that myself tonight, Pam, and I'm, I'm not sure exactly how to address this one issue. Uh, uh, it seemed to be focused on the uh, homeowner's insurance and their premiums. Um, I'm going to do some research on that because I'd be really surprised as a retired banker working in that industry and uh, for a number of years, I would be really surprised if the insurance companies are relying on one item to set their replacement value on the properties that they insure. Um, I, would, I would hope they use a little bit more discretion than that, but I could be wrong. Um, but. The other side of that issue is in the market that we're in, so many of the properties that I've seen selling on Zillow here recently are still selling in proximity to where they've been selling for the past year. And if you have your home destroyed and you don't have it insured for an actual replacement value, when you go out to try and replace it, you're gonna find yourself in a much smaller place to live if you can find a place to live yeah. for what you might get out of the insurance if you don't have it properly written. So um, I'm going to do some checking on that myself. But, you know, we spent a lot of time looking at this in the past couple of years, dealing with the issue of paying the state funding and uh, or reimbursing the state for uh, utility taxes and to the tune of about $800,000 in the last two years, looking at having to do another 400000 this year. I've already paid the money for a revaluation to turn around and do it again. Within less than two years, we'd pay the same dollar amount to do it all over again. So it's a thorny issue, very thorny issue. Um, 
I understand everybody's concerns, but uh, we've got to we've got to come up with a plan to take care of this issue for our citizens and for the benefit of the county. For coming up with a good solution. Thank you. I'm going to agree with Ms. Thompson and Mr. Carter uh, in that uh, the revals were much, much higher than I think any one of the five of us even dreamed they would be. Uh, but having said that, I, along with Mr. Carter, I'm looking at Zillow and all kinds of things, and I'm not uh, here on the radio in different places that prices are dropping dramatically, but I'm not seeing it in the sales. And you can go on the Alamance County uh, GIS site and see the actual sales in your neighborhood. And I'm not seeing the dr dramatic drops that are being uh, talked about, particularly on radio. Um, so that's bothersome. Um, so I ask, uh, I ask right now, again, uh, I already know the answer. Attorneys don't ask questions they don't know the answer to, supposedly. Um, what would it cost? What did it cost us to do the valuation that we currently have? One point two million dollars. Uh, I won't. Or. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I <laughs> promise you that's accurate. <laughs> <laughs> I don't yeah. doubt it. Yeah, either one. Of you. I I don't have that figure in front of me. Hold on just a second, unless you know off the top. Well, Mr. Atkins told me between one point three and one point two. So I think, I think right. Mr. Lashley's dead on the money. Mm -hmm. uh, and then so the second question would be, if we choose to have a new, because I've had citizens call me, now why don't you have it re-evaluated? Uh, if we do that, it's going to cost us a minimum of $1.2 to $1.3 million to have it re-evaluated. And I don't think that's a smart use of county money, taxpayer money either. Um, and you're going to have the same problem coming up again. And from what I'm seeing, the price is, um, price for two before, I bought one this past, I bought several this past weekend. Um, it's coming down, but not much. Uh, it's still sky beyond high. Um, so, you know, we're in a real dilemma, the five of us because if we ask for a new valuation again, then we're going to spend a boatload of money. Uh, if we don't, if any way we as commissioners move, we're going to be looked at as uh, done, having done something wrong. Um, so I don't see spending $1.3 million for a new valuation. Um, we are, and I would encourage everyone that um, has an argument or a dispute or even a concern to appeal your, you know, t to the county. Um, and those appeals, if you get a letter back just saying, hey, uh, do you agree or disagree, uh, you have to check the block and you have to respond. Because if you do not respond, we as the county commissioners are required to say that hey, you've agreed to that no change or whatever the change was. So be really, really careful and be prompt. May 5th is your deadline for appealing. But I would really encourage everyone, if they dispute their valuation, because we can't even set our tax rate until we know pretty much what's going on with these evaluations. Uh, so if you have a question, appeal it, but follow through. Don't just get a letter back saying, hey, we didn't change it. You have to go before, and it's called the Board of? Equalization. Equalization. Uh, and then they can give you a hearing. Don't just stop if you don't like it. Follow mm -hmm. through. Uh, and that's really, really, really important. Um, <coughs> County Manager, do you have anything to encourage beyond that? Do you have the cost of repair pulled up? No. It, it's, believe me, it's 102. Okay. Yeah. It's one, like you said, 1.2 to 1.3, but I just want to also add 
that that does not include what we get banged by the four hundred thousand dollars right. estate. Right. So if we redo the revaluation this year, like folks want to, you will get a penny increase in your taxes because that's how much it's going to cost us to get it done. And then we're going to have to do it again. So guess what? You get banged two pennies for something that we can do right now. I didn't set up. I apologize for taking your time, no, but no, I apologize. Uh, I did not want to do revaluation right now, but we have no choice. The state has pretty much told us that if we don't do it, we're still going to have to pay four hundred thousand dollars a year. So we need to go ahead and bite the bullet. And I'll say this again: I promise everybody that's listening that I will work my tail off that we make this revenue neutral. If there's one thing in this world I know is numbers, and I promise you that I will make sure that everybody in this county knows exactly what we're looking at and why we're looking at it and where we land, and you will be told why that you'll be. I, I will fill you in on why we are landing on the number that we're diving on, because believe me, this is one of the things that um, it's very stressful. <laughs> And I knew that we were going to have these problems when we did the reevaluation, just based solely on the numbers that I see in my day-to-day -day work. Uh, I knew that I didn't think the valuation would be 80 uh, percent. My number, and I guess if uh, if Jeremy was here, he would know that my number was 62. My number was 62 percent. We'll say, Chairman, um, our our number of appeals is down. Mm -hmm way below what we thought it would be yep. uh, as a commissioner I'm, I'm thinking okay does that mean that more people have looked at what their house is really worth on the market and have decided it's accurate or are they waiting till the last minute I hope not are they waiting the last minute to file an appeal I agree with what's been said already and I've told this over and over and over again to people who brought it up to me if you think your evaluation is too high or if it looks like it's way above what we've said over and over again is the average, don't hesitate to file an appeal. Um, that's the only way to try and get it balanced and get it right. And then as, as Bill just said, when we, we can't actually set a tax rate until we know what the adjusted base is. And the adjusted base is after the appeals. So after we look at all, after the, uh, our tax manager looks at all the appeals then we adjust down from that what the tax base is and that's how we determine what we're going to have in revenue and how much we need to operate the county on and set a tax rate and our every man and woman on this board is committed to trying to determine a revenue neutral rate so well, it also indicate that state law requires us to have a budget passed by June 30. So we have two meetings in June. Uh, we will likely review the proposed budget from the county administration during the first meeting. We can take a vote that same night, but we often postpone it to two weeks later to the second meeting in June. But by state law, we must have a budget by, in reality, that second meeting. Uh, in fact, factually, uh, by June 30, but I hope we don't have to call an additional meeting. I would hope not. Uh, and I agree with what everyone has said. One, we're really concerned as commissioners. Uh, two, we don't know what the tax rate will be at this point. Uh, and three, if you don't like what you've seen, appeal it but follow through. I'm hearing on the radio occasionally, <coughs> well, they just wrote me a letter saying, uh, they, they didn't agree. Well, then go to the Board of Equalization and have your hearing so you can have your say in what that final number is. Uh, and then they will make a determination. And I think, Mr. County Attorney, that there's an appeal beyond that, is there not? State property tax. Yes. Well, well, just to add to that, it's, it's kind of like this. Um, everybody lives here in Alamance County and my housing estimate went up $140,000. I don't have a pool. I don't even have pavement. I have gravel and I need more. And, and I say that in saying that everybody's probably thinking, what did I do to my house or my home 
that somebody thought I've made these improvements and it went up because I lived here the day before this happened. I live here the day after and I see no change. <laughs> and I mean, I'm just speaking common sense because that's how I would think about it. And I, you know, I, I say this a lot. I saw this in the school system whenever we were rezoning. We'd have a couple of schools that were really solid commitment and they were in the gyms where the auditoriums were packed. Other schools, a handful. And, and I just encourage us all, I'm preaching to myself, to quit living our lives based on the day after's headlines in the media. Because once that's been printed, it's done, so to speak. You don't know if it's true or not nowadays. But I'm just saying, you know, Henry Vines and Mr. Moser, you are here. And I appreciate how committed you are. You are the furthest thing from a pain in the butt I've ever seen. <laughs> and I appreciate you and respect you because you care enough about you and your family to come up here and talk to these commissioners, us, about your county because your pocketbook pays for everything. And I don't realize, I don't know if taxpayers realize that you're like genius over here, <coughs> stockbroker. You are stockbrokers. We all are stockbrokers in Alamance County. And without us, there is no nothing. There is no services. I'm so thankful when I call 911 that they come running. I'm so thankful I turn that water on and it works. We are so blessed in America to have things and I am all about taxes paying for that and the poor if that's when they need it. I'm not about getting ripped off. That's not how the four fought with the great founders, founders, whatever, made it to be that way. Boy, if they could come back, they might flip us all off. But I'm just saying, I appreciate folks that come into this meeting and do a public comment. It takes a lot of guts, it can be intimidating. I remember when parents used to come before us to do transfer, it's like we were a flipping Wizard of Oz, and we're just like you. We want the best for your kid, I want the best for my county. So I can't encourage people enough to come into this meeting and speak to us. We need your public comments, because we're not the boss. We're not the kings and the queens. We represent you. We are your, Bill gets calls, everybody here gets calls. And it has everything to do with the notes I take and it helps me to form my opinion, unless it's absolutely insane. And that's not hardly ever that I've met that person yet. But um, Alamance County, you sit back and watch what's happening to your state, your, your country. You better stand up for your freedom and your rights because things can change overnight and it's so subtle you don't even realize it. It's like the mouse standing on top of feed in a glass. He'll eat and eat and eat and eat, just fill his little tummy before you know he's at the bottom of the glass and he's trapped. And he never saw it coming, it was very subtle. So wide open, eyes, that's what you got to do. And you got to be able to stand up for yourself because if you don't, you know, I used to tell parents all the time, you are your child's best advocate. You know your kid better than anybody. You know your family better than anybody. You know your land better than anybody. And uh, Mr. Moser calls me, he'll call me, Commissioner Thompson, I'm going, stop it. I went to school with your kids, I'm Pam. But that's, I appreciate that respect. I don't get that a lot. So um, I'm just thankful for anybody who comes in here. And if you're here more than once, that tells me how much you really are invested in this county. And I wish we all were invested in this county like that. We might be in a different situation. Mr. Chairman, before you adjourn, can I clarify some things that comments you've made on the ENR board? Board? Normally, it's outside the procedure to allow speakers. Uh, I'm going to yield to but the board. But that's Mr. Bale. And say, <laughs> I'm going to yield to the board, and if you would, absolutely, if you join me and would like for him to speak, I'm going to say yes. Absolutely. Yes, yes right. So you have got permission of all five well, people. Well, what I want to clarify, I want to put some at ease. I am the acting ENR chairman of the equalization board. We have met and the agenda has been set. We're going to start. We'll start April the 4th and it'll go through July. We'll meet every week. We've got 2,280 complaints to date or maybe more. I will tell you this. This is one of the things that we're doing this year that we haven't done before. And that is this. We're going to give three comps for everybody that's got a complaint in their area. We're going to give three comps and that's going to relax a lot of people to know that they ain't been pointed or 
called out for their property. So there's going to be a, a lot of changes, and I remind you folks, too, <coughs> in 2009, I sat through 17,000. So we are a whole lot ahead of the game this year than we've ever been before. And I'm told, and we've got an expert that's coming in and helping us revive this year, thanks to y'all adding that there, and it's going to be a whole lot different than it's ever been before, folks. But we are prepared to listen to everything and everybody, and we've got a lot to hear, and we're going to act as professionals, and we're going to listen to the needs of the county. Mm -hmm. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. <coughs> Can we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Motion to second. Any other comments? All in favor signify by saying I am me. I am <laughs> <laughs>Thank you for watching the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Commissioner meetings typically occur on the first and third Monday of each month in the Commissioner's Chambers at the County Office Building at 124 West Elm Street in Graham. The first Monday meeting begins at 9.30 a.m. and the third Monday meeting begins at 6.30 p.m. Changes to the meeting schedule will be posted on the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. The video of this meeting will be broadcast on LocalGov TV. Please go to www.localgov.com of TVNC.com for more information about their schedule and to see more videos produced by your local governments. You can also access this meeting through our YouTube channel at www.youtube.com forward slash Alamance County NC or by clicking the YouTube link on the county website. Technical questions regarding this meeting's broadcast or production may be sent to our county webmaster at webmaster at alamance-nc.com. This address is for technical questions only. Comments and questions about the content of this meeting may be made to the commissioners themselves. You can find their contact information at the Alamance County website at www.alamance-nc.com. There, you can click on the link that says County Commissioners to learn more about the commissioners, read minutes and agendas of commissioner meetings, and find other other information about the county commissioners. You can also send mail correspondence to County Commissioners, 124 West Elm Street, Graham, North Carolina, 27253. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Alamance County Commissioners meeting. Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments.